The Moon Metal. Chapter 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moon Metal by Garrett P. Service. Read by Betsy Bush in Marquette, Michigan, June 2007. Chapter 3 The Grand Teton Mine. Away on the western border of Wyoming, in the all but inaccessible heart of the Rocky Mountains, three mighty brothers, the Big Tetons, look perpendicularly into the blue eyes of Jenny's Lake, lying at the bottom of the profound depression among the mountains called Jackson's Hole. Bracing against one another for support, these remarkable peaks lift their granite spires from 12,000 to nearly 14,000 feet into the blue dome that arches the crest of the continent. Their sides, and especially those of their chief, the Grand Teton, are streaked with glaciers, which shine like silver trappings when the morning sun comes up above the wilderness of mountains stretching away eastward from the hole. When the first white men penetrated this wonderful region, and one of them bestowed his wife's name upon Jenny's Lake, they were intimidated by the Grand Teton. It made their flesh creep. Accustomed though they were to rough scrambling among mountain gorges and on the brows of immense precipices, when they glanced up at the face of the peak, where the cliffs fall one below another in a series of breathless descents, and imagined themselves clinging for dear life to those skyey battlements. But when, in 1872, Messrs. Stevenson and Langford finally reached the top of the Grand Teton, the only successful members of a party of nine practiced climbers who had started together from the bottom, they found there a little rectangular enclosure made by piling up rocks, six or seven feet across and three feet in height, bearing evidences of great age, and indicating that the Red Indians had, for some unknown purpose, resorted to the summit of this tremendous peak long before the white men invaded their mountains. Yet neither the Indians nor the whites ever really conquered the Teton, for above the highest point that they attained rises a granite buttress, whose smooth vertical sides seem to them to defy everything but wings. Winding across the sage-covered floor of Jackson's Hole runs the Shoshone, or Snake River, which takes its rise from Jackson's Lake at the northern end of the basin, and then, as if shrinking from the threatening brows of the Tetons, whose fall would block its progress, makes a detour of one hundred miles around the buttressed heights of the range before it finds a clear way across Idaho, and so on to the Columbia River and the Pacific Ocean. On a July morning, about a month after the visit of Dr. Max Six to the assembled financiers in New York, a party of twenty horsemen, following a mountain trail, arrived on the eastern margin of Jackson's Hole, and pausing upon a commanding eminence, with exclamations of wonder, glanced across the great depression where lay the shining coils of the snake river at the towering forms of the tetons whose ice-striped cliffs flashed lightnings in the sunshine even the impassive broncos that the party rode lifted their heads inquiringly and snorted as if in equine astonishment at the magnificent spectacle one familiar with the place would have noticed something which to his mind would have seemed more surprising than the pageantry of the mountains in their morning sun-bath curling above one of the wild gorges that cut the lower slopes of the tetons was a thick black smoke which when lifted by a passing breeze obscured the precipices half way to the summit of the peaks had the grand teton become a volcano certainly no hunting or exploring party could make a smoke like that but a word from the leader of the party of horsemen explained the mystery there is my mill and the mine is underneath it the speaker was dr six and his companions were members of the financial congress when he quitted their presence in new york with the promise to return within an hour for their reply he had no doubt in his mind what the reply would be he knew they would accept his proposition, and they did. No time was then lost in communicating with the various governments, and arrangements were quickly perfected, whereby, in case the inspection of Dr. Six's mines and its resources proved satisfactory, America and Europe would unite in adopting the new metal as the basis of their coinage. As soon as this stage in the negotiations was reached, it only remained to send a committee of financiers and metallurgists, in company with Dr. Six, to the Rocky Mountains. 
they started under the doctor's guidance, completing the last stage of their journey on horseback. "'And inspection of the records at Washington,' Dr. Six continued, addressing the horseman, "'will show that I have filed a claim covering ten acres of ground around the mouth of my mine. "'This was done as soon as I had discovered the metal. "'The filing of the claim and the subsequent proceedings which perfected my ownership "'attracted no attention, because everybody was thinking of the South Pole and its gold fields. "'The party gathered closer around Dr. Six, and listened to his words with silent attention, "'while their horses rubbed noses and jingled their gold-mounted trappings. "'As soon as I had legally protected myself,' he continued, "'I employed a force of men, transported my machinery and material across the mountains, "'erected my furnaces, and opened the mine. "'I was safe from intrusion, and even from idle curiosity, for the reason I have just mentioned.' In fact, so exclusive was the attention of the new gold fields that I had difficulty in obtaining workmen, and finally I sent to Africa and engaged Negroes, whom I placed in charge of trustworthy foremen. Accordingly, with half a dozen exceptions, you will see only black men in the mine. And with their aid you have mined enough metal to supply the mints of the world? asked President Boone. Exactly so, was the reply, but I no longer employ the large force which I needed at first. "'How much metal have you on hand? "'I am aware that you have already answered this question "'during our preliminary negotiations, "'but I ask it again for the benefit of some members of our party "'who were not present then.' "'I shall show you to-day,' said Dr. Six, with his curious smile. Twenty-five hundred tons of refined artemisium "'stacked in rock-cut vaults under the Grand Teton. "'And you have dared to collect such inconceivable wealth in one place?' "'You forget that it is not wealth until the people have learned to value it, "'and the governments have put their stamp upon it. "'True, but how did you arrive at the proper moment? "'Easily. I first ascertained that before the Antarctic discoveries "'the world contained altogether about 16,000 tons of gold, "'valued at $450,000 per ton, "'or $7,200,000,000 worth all told.' Now my metal weighs, bulk for bulk, one quarter as much as gold. It might be reckoned at the same intrinsic value per ton, but I have considered it preferable to take advantage of the smaller weight of the new metal, which permits us to make coins of the same size as the old ones, but only one quarter as heavy, by giving to artemisium four times the value per ton that gold had. Thus only four thousand tons of the new metal are required to supply the place of the sixteen thousand tons of gold. The 2,500 tons which I already have on hand are more than enough for coinage. The rest I can supply as fast as needed. The party did not wait for further explanations. They were eager to see the wonderful mine and the store of treasure. Spurs were applied, and they galloped down the steep trail, forded the Snake River, and skirting the shore of Jenny's Lake, soon found themselves gazing up the headlong slopes and dizzy parapets of the Grand Teton. Dr. Six led them by a steep ascent to the mouth of the canyon, above one of whose walls stood his mill, and where the champ-champ of a powerful engine saluted their ears. End of chapter 3 This recording is in the public domain.